first of all, what your equipment is is going to depend on what the patient has as far as their disease process, right? So I'd like to mention tuberculosis. The TB bacterium is 5 microns in diameter. This loop mask is not going to protect you from somebody with tuberculosis, okay? The loop mask, you put it on like this, pinch it around your nose, pull it around your ears, pull it under your chin. Pretty easy to put on. This is good if you're doing a dressing change, like somebody's got bursa, measles, mumps, uh, ARDS, uh, SARS. This will work. However, TB, you want an N95 respirator. Now this should have this is this should have two uh, loops, but I want you to know the difference. A, lo a loop a loop mask is not going to protect you from tuberculosis. This will because this is a HEPA filter, high efficiency particle arrester, and it can trap the tuberculosis bacteria. Respirator masks like these are only good for about 20 minutes. That's all you got. Then the efficacy of the mask starts to deteriorate because of the moisture that you're breathing out from your mouth. So really, if you're going to be in a room longer than 20 minutes, you got a problem. Okay? These are, when you put them on, should form a, uh, an, no air should be able to get through when you put these on. Actually, this was your job, wasn't it, John? Yeah. Making sure that people had these fit properly. Because if you've got gaps in here, then what's going to happen is you're not really protecting yourself at all. The air can get in. So typically, if I'm in a TV room, when I doff or take off my isolation equipment, I'll take this off outside the door. Because there's no, what's the purpose of taking it off while you're in the room, right? You're defeating the purpose of having it on. So that leads me to tell, so we got contact droplet airborne, such as TB. I'll put TB over here. The other type of isolation we have. And is, that, is this the answer, Nancy, you're giving us? I mean. No. Oh, okay. Not, I'm going to show you. All right. All right. I'm just giving you a, 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 All right. a, an idea of the different so kinds of isolation that okay. we have. When you don isolation equipment, think about the root word. What's the root word for don? On. on right? So donning equipment, donning, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go with gown, mask, goggles. And gloves, last. Of course, you've already washed your hands. If you're a phlebotomist, take two of everything into the room and leave your phlebotomy tray at the nurse's desk or covered on the isolation cart. You don't want to take all that blood that you just drew into an isolation room. Right? Because you'll have to throw it all away. And do all your blood draws all over again. So I'm going to show you how to don isolation equipment. And we've got different kinds of isolation gowns here. This is a plastic one. It appears to be in fairly good shape. Notice it's got a head uh, opening for my head. And well, my gloves are right here. So watch. So I'm going to so before you go into the isolation room, outside of the door, it's going to say isolation. Is it going to tell you what kind of isolation? Why? It'll tell you what's aware. It may. Where's the best resource for you to know what to wear? It should be on the door. Well, you can't always trust that. The chart. Access the chart or ask, tell the nurse. Because if they have TB and they don't have one of these masks in the isolation cart, you think that, well, they don't have these masks because I don't have to wear these masks. They're absolutely wrong. They don't have them because I forgot to stock them. So you need to know to, how to protect yourself, okay? So you put, after you've washed your hands, let's go ahead and put on a, put your isolation gown on. Now, this is 
nice because it's got a hole for the thumb. Now I tell my students, most of the time these gowns are paper or plastic. If there's not a hole for your thumb, pop one. And I'll show you why in a minute. So we're going to go ahead and put the isolation gown on. There we go. And usually I've gotten to the habit when I put an isolation gown on to lean forward so I don't touch my uniform because when I take it off, I'm always leaning because you don't want to take this off with dirty hands, right? And I'm going to show you the way I do it, a little bit different than the CDC. So tie your gown, and if you think you can ask someone who's walking down the hall to tie your gown, think twice. They will laugh at you. I'll say tie your own gown. You're kind of on your own. Okay. So gown, mask. So I'm going to do a loop mask because I don't want to put this on. This is demonstration. So I'm going to grab another loop mask. Gown, mask, over the bridge of your nose, pinch, pull around your ears, pull it out. So gown, mask, goggles, well, if you're drawing blood and someone is a bleeder, there I have it. You're doing a PT and or a PTT, which is a blue tube, first in the order of draws and then blood cultures, then you might want to wear a face shield in case they bleed because you can, they can uh, <coughs> spurt blood at you through the, the veins sometimes. Oh, so, okay, so gown, mask, the goggles, if necessary, gloves. Now this is why I say pop a hole for your finger because when you put the gloves on, you form a barrier now where your wrist is protected. <coughs> Do you see that? Mm -hmm. So as a nurse, if I have to change somebody, I can put my hand underneath them and not worry about getting shingles if they have shingles, right, on my arm. And it actually happened to me. I caught shingles once, too, from a patient that wasn't diagnosed with shingles, came in from one of the hospitals, went to the convalescent home. The nurse missed the outbreak, and I was helping one of my nurse's aides turn her. I was holding her, and uh, I got it right on my arm. Well, was a couple weeks, about a week or so later. So here we go. Gown, mask, goggles, gloves, right? Mm -hmm. That's how we don mm -hmm. personal protective equipment. Now I'm ready to go into the isolation room. Now while I'm in the isolation room, when I'm all done, I have to doff my equipment. What's the root word for oh, doffing? Oh. Yeah, you guys are amazing. The root word for doffing is off. So doff, D-O-F-F-I-N-G, here's doff. And the first thing I'm going to do is apologize when this video goes online to the CDC. <laughs> because I'm not going to do it the way the CDC does it. Only because I've done this for so many years and so much that I've found maybe a little bit an easier way of doing it. So, what am I, I'm, I'm, I've got nasty on, okay? okay? Blood, body fluids, from my gloves to my gown, okay? okay? First thing I want to do is I'd like to get rid of my gown and my gloves simultaneously. Mm -hmm. I don't really want to take off my gloves and then fool with my gown, mm -hmm. right? And notice, my back is not covered, right? right? So I could get some nasty on the back of my uniform. So what am I gonna do? Well, I'm gonna grab my gown, I'm gonna pull it forward. Let's get this nasty off. Now watch what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna roll this forward, like this. This was the side that was clean to me, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to pinch my glove like this and pull it off. This was clean to me, wasn't it? This was clean to me. So I'm going to do this. And now I'm going to come over to the wastebasket in the patient's room, put my finger underneath my glove, and boom, gown and gloves, gone. Now I can wash my hands take off my mask. Never put your hands on your mask like this. Never. Okay, always find a space. Grab it. Dispose of it. Now you're ready.
ready to leave the isolation room. Wash your hands, paper towel, wherever. Open the door, step out, and you're done. Goggles. Goggles would go last. Okay, the other last. Okay. Well, no, they wouldn't go last. If I had goggles, the goggles would come off, then the mask. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because my goggles would be over my mask. Oh. So if I had goggles, after I got the gown and gloves, then the goggles, I would, to get rid of goggles, you just put your fingers on the temples of the goggles and just push them into the garbage. Okay. You never, never grab anything from the front. Okay, just push them into the garbage and then take your mask off. Um, so doffing, what I do is I do gown and gloves or gloves and gown, uh, gloves, gown, simultaneously. I, I get these babies off together because I just want that nasty off all together, right? And then I'll go goggles and then mask, okay? Now, you'll see in your books and online that we show you the way the CDC does it. We break it down for you. Um, and certainly, however works for you, you want to be able to do that. Um, but you can, you know, just learn what, what what method works best for you, okay? So what, next question, do, doffing, you've got that, right? Yeah. Uh, 15, what type of respirator would you use for TB? N95. N95, right? So for TB, we're going to use the N as in Nancy, 95 fit tested respirator. And you can always tell if somebody has an airborne precaution because on their isolation door above it, like the exit signs, it might say rest, it will say negative pressure. A negative pressure room means when I open the door, like if I'm going into the room, the door will open inward usually, and air is going to come in this way if it's negative pressure. Positive pressure means if I open the door, the air is going to go out. We don't want TV air to come out do it. So negative pressure should give you a, a signal. It should kind of make you have like that little warning sign flashing in your mind. Uh-oh, that's respiratory precautions. Okay? Good job. Okay, list three. Learning domains. Now, as medical health care providers, we're also teachers. Let me tell you, we must be infirm, mentally uh, challenged, the elderly, uh, physically challenged. You will have to, you know, develop your own method of communication, which is very therapeutic. Always, we use therapeutic communication in the healthcare field. And when you think about it. Everybody has learning domains. Benjamin Bloom mentioned that we have three. We have the cognitive, the psychomotor, and the affective. Those are our three learning domains. Let me explain what these are. Right now, you're using your cognitive domain, your thinking, your critical processing domain about what I'm saying, you're writing it down, you know, you're critically thinking. When we did hand washing, you followed by my example. I showed you how we did it. You demonstrated to me how to wash your hands. That was your hand-eye coordination or your psychomotor domain, right? And the fact that you guys are still here means that you want to be here. You want to learn. Want to become the bottoms. So the desire to learn is your effective domain. You see? And you need all three of these things to be to learn, really, because in the next few minutes we're going to be time trackers. Yippee. Okay? So think about when you have to draw blood on a patient. Think about what learning domains do they possess. If somebody has cerebral palsy, you know, they may not be able to, you know, stretch their arm out. Like you could say to someone, I'm going to put this tourniquet on your arm, please 
you know, lay your arm here on the table, they may not be able to do that. Their psychomotor domain may not be functioning properly. They may not be able to understand what you're saying to them if you have someone who's profoundly mentally challenged. So their cognitive domain isn't going to work very well. And of course, with little children and babies, they don't want to be in a phlebotomy lab, right? You can hear them a mile away. Some children that keep have to come for blood draws will come into the lab and they'll start screaming as soon as they walk in. Before they see the needle, before they see the person in the, the lab, their screaming starts immediately. So think about that, and you'll read more about that on the website. Um, list two of the white blood cells. Well, your white cells are your infection control army. And white, another name for white cells are leukocytes. Or white cells. And I'll give you a list of the white cells and you can choose which ones you like. So out of the leukocytes we have basophils. We have neutrophils. We have eosinophils. We have monocytes. And we have lymphocytes. You pick the one that you like. The kissing disease. Cytomegalovirus. You heard about it, right? Maybe you guys like the monocytes. You're going to remember monocytes next week on your quiz. Um, new infections. Neutrophils. New. New infections. Those will be higher. Um, parasitic infections. Parasites like aliens. Eosinophils. Like ET. Aliens. Okay, you might like eosinophils. Of course, lymphocytes, lymphatic system. So those are our white cells. You can take your time and pick out a couple of a couple of those to know on the quiz next week, which is actually going to be this one. So I should get A's out of all of you next week. Easy A's, right? Okay, list three areas or conditions where a phlebotomy technician can never draw. We talked about that under scope of practice this morning, didn't we? So what did you come up with? What can you think about right now? Where can legs, they draw? Legs, legs, feet, feet, legs, hands, hands, right? They can't draw. Can't draw where there's if someone's had a mastectomy, right? Right. Can't draw in an area that where there's scar tissue. You're not yeah, going to find a vein very well. Yeah, not a good area. They they have keloids and scar tissue. Um, can't draw where's where you have an IV. You can't draw from an IV. If somebody's got an IV in their arm, the last thing I want is a phlebotomist to go and access that IV site and draw blood from it. Because an hour or two later, when I go to give them medication, the blood that they took out has dried and coagulated in the tubing, and now I can't give them their morphine shot, and I have to give them a shot somewhere on their body and cause them more pain, and I'll have to take the IV out start a new IV all over again. So they're going to get poked twice because the phlebotomist tried to draw blood and pull blood from an IV. What about people who've got tattoos and all over their body? If they're new tattoos, we don't want you to draw them in that tattoo. area. Well, no, because of the ink. Okay. If it's a new tattoo. If older tattoos, I actually, I kind of like because people that come in for draws, if they've had tattoos, I had this one guy come in, had this amazing tattoo, and the eye was right on his medial cubital. <laughs> so it's like, dead center, boy. You know, a lot of the students really, his, his, uh, the student that brought him in really enjoyed that because always dead on, you know, right in the pupil, where that eye is, you know, or right side of the nose. Um, because you're going to be using markers when you draw blood. You won't always see a vein. You feel it. See it, so you have to mark it. Was there any others, Nancy? Was it a heart condition? I just remember something else. 
Oh. You're supposed to say the opposite. Yeah. Oh, was it it's stroke someone. or heart condition? Either. You can't draw an arm that's paralyzed. Yeah, right. Paralysis if they don't have good blood right. flow. If they're getting total parenteral nutrition or if they're getting some type of IV fluid, the nurse has to shut the IV off for 20 minutes. You can't touch an IV. You can't shut an IV off. Ever. Ever. Because if you turn it back on and you don't know what the drip rate is, you can kill somebody. Mm. You can cause them to go into congestive heart failure or fluid overload. Never touch an IV. Uh, so have the nurse shut it off 20 minutes, come in, draw on the opposite arm if possible. Because certain IV fluids, other than your isotonic 0.9 normal saline, some of your hypotonic solutions or hypertonic solutions like lactated ringers will cause a false elevation in the blood values because of the, the electrolytes flowing through the body. I had a question. Legs, feet, and hand, we can never draw. Is that your? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Can, that is not a last resort. The hand. No, if I can't hit you, if I can't get you here. Do a finger stick. Okay. Okay. We've got capillary yeah. tubes that you can do finger okay. sticks on. Yes, Adriana. What if you have been ordered to draw on someone who's a um, quadriplegic? Oh, I don't think you can. You can't do it. You're going to have. Sorry. They're going to have to get a mediport or something because a quadriplegic. Quad, they don't have enough good circulation. You could do a finger stick. See these micro containers right here? When you lance the finger, all you have to do is fill one of these up. And they can run the same exact test as the other ones. You have to understand that people that have paralyzed limbs, the blood flow is not that good. You can cause a, you can cause a uh, backup. You could cause a cyst. You could cause uh, a lymphatic. Uh, cyst by drawing on people that are paraplegic or quadriplegic. You stay away from paralyzed limbs. If somebody has to have blood drawn consistently that is a quadriplegic, then it's better for them to get a medicord put in their chest. Somewhere where they, people can access the blood on a regular basis. Kind of like a nurse would do that. Yes. Or medical assistants can actually access Mediports. Medical assistants down at some of the hospitals in Detroit actually uh, work in the cancer center, and they hook up the uh, they hook up the what do you call it? Uh, hello. Um, they they actually hook up the chemotherapy to the patients, so they access the Mediports with a Huber needle. Sometimes people go home with pick lines, triple lumen, double lumen, pick line. Because, and, and in an IV class, we'll show you how to draw from pick line. And we'll show you, we'll go through that. It's not easy. If you have a triple, I've been in a room for 30 minutes just trying to get a couple tubes of blood from a pick line because of all the flushing I have to do before and afterward. That's why you have to stay away from IVs. If somebody's got a hep lock and they don't have a bag attached to an IV access, it doesn't mean that that's for your blood draw. They're a hard drug. Do what? By the way, if you go in blood emergency and they start you off by you, but they don't put the tool in their bag, but they get blood from there. They're not supposed to. Okay. No, no, no. Because you, phlebotomists, if they don't know how to flush, and flushing is very important to understand, and they don't understand about sterile field and things like that, you're just going to leave a clot of blood in there, and we're going to have to jump the whole thing. A lot of us draw from that. Stay away from IVs. They're not for blood draws. Now, if I'm starting an IV and the phlebotomist is in the room and she says I need a tube of blood, well then as soon as I get that angio cap into the vein, before I hook up any tubing, I'll draw off the blood. Okay. And then I'll flush and I'll start the IV bag. But for phlebotomists just to access an IV site, because they know it's venous access, they're, they're causing us a lot of problems and the patient too, because now I can't push emergency medications through there because the blood's already coagulated. Okay. All right. How does therapeutic communication in the healthcare field differ from normal communication? What do you think? I think you guys know this answer. Therapeutic communication versus normal communication. Now what's normal communication? Hi everybody. Ask 
questions even more than yes or no, where you have to actually get the full response. Open-ended questions. For instance, I'll come over to Marquise. Marquise, may I use you as an example? Yes. Oh, she's so kind. Good afternoon. I am Nancy. I will be your nurse today. How are you feeling? Is there anything that I can get you today? Or is, are, you, are, you, are you in any pain right now? No pain. No pain? Okay. But I, I like to use it. Mm -hmm. So cute. Well, it's cute. Oh, I can do that for you. So, um, uh -uh. you haven't had any chest pain or anything like that overnight? No chest pain. Okay. Good. Well, that's wonderful. I'm going to go ahead and get you those. If you need me, give me a call. I did. That was rhetorical, wasn't it? <laughs> have you had chest pain? Should have been better, right? But what am I doing? Okay. How, how, how am I... You're letting her answer for you. We're interacting. Okay. What about eye contact? What's going on with the eye contact? I'm making You're eye making contact. Her, making her feel comfortable. Yeah, feel comfortable right? Notice I'm trying to do what here? Be at her level. Eye level. Eye level, right? Because when people are in wheelchairs, you come up to somebody in a wheelchair, what are you doing? You're looking down. Right. Looking looking down. down on That's profound, isn't it? You're looking down. Uh, they get that too. When I take my mom out to eat in a wheelchair, the, 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 the what do you call it, the hostess mm -hmm. will look at me and say, where would she like to sit? And my mom, she was feisty, she'll say, hey, right here. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Ask me where I want to sit. <laughs> Some people, they, they, they really, they're, they don't know how to handle people that are handicapped, you know? And I don't fault them for that, really, but I like it. I just let my mom go, go to town. It's like, yeah, I'm not getting involved in this one. Go for it. So, alrighty, good. So you've got, you got the normal people. Yeah. Even if they're not offended or anything, it's, it's also just uncomfortable to look up, to look up at somebody and talk. It's it just, is. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, so it's nice that you can kind of kneel. That, that there's profound meaning in all of that. Okay, what are the three veins in the antecubital fossa? Can you name them for me? Medial, Good job. Yeah. I think we're good here. So, so how do you think you're going to do on this test? You're going to knock it out, quiz. You're going to knock it out of the ballpark next week. Yeah. Okay. Sure, you will. Absolutely, you will. Uh, I, what I'd like to do. Uh, I know we're here to two, and I haven't given you guys a lunch yet. I was wondering if you can go with me for maybe another 40 minutes, and we'll call it a day. How about that? Yes. Can you make it?